All right. Pretty heavy reading there, Jeremiah chapter 23. This entire passage is basically calling out the false prophets of the day of Jeremiah. And there's a lot of things that are given here, a lot of attributes that we see about false prophets and false teachers. And there's a, there's a special place. There's a, you know, being a false prophet is not something that everybody does, obviously. Because this is something that someone who is stepping into a position of being a pastor, of being a leader of like a church or something, it's only people who kind of step into those roles who are going to end up, that could potentially end up being in this category of being a false teacher, a false prophet, a son of the devil that, that is looking to steer people away or doesn't give reverence to the word of God. And we see here a, a lot of things that God is, is very, gets very angry about this and, and no doubt. What is it that, that gets a person saved? I mean, think, think about the integrity of God's word. How much God puts an emphasis on his word. And what is it that we have to believe? We have to believe the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God saves our soul. Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. God's word is extremely important. It's so important that he said, I'm going to preserve it. He's not left it just up to man solely to preserve his word. He says, I'm going to preserve my word. Because that's the only way he's going to make sure that his word can be unadulterated and survive and be timeless throughout the ages. God has an emphasis on his word. And you know what gets him angry is when people say, thus saith the Lord, and they speak out of their own heart. When someone says, this is what God said, and it's not what God said at all. And in this example, he's getting to the point where at the end of the chapter, he's like, I'm telling you specifically, don't say the burden of the Lord. He's like, I don't want you using that phrase. I don't want you saying that anymore. And what do they do? People are still saying the burden of the Lord is this, the burden of the Lord. And just in direct contradiction to what God himself was saying. And they'll just say, thus saith the Lord. And they just come up with whatever. Okay. We're going to get into some of the specifics here, but... The reason why I'm getting into this and I want to help explain, you know, how bad it is. And we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 2 also when we're done here in Jeremiah 23. 2 Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jude also cover, I mean, there are entire chapters of the Bible dedicated to false prophets. And just, just giving us warnings about them, explaining their characteristics, how wicked and how evil and reprobate that they are. And it's important to understand that these people exist. Now, just to be clear, because I'm not going to get too far into all of the different attributes, because I'm going to be preaching about a specific person this morning. Not everybody who's caught up in a false religion that's been deceived, that maybe becomes like a preacher or something within their religion, not all of them are considered what the Bible calls a false prophet. Those words, a false prophet is reserved for someone who is a wolf in sheep's clothing, who is a bad person, who is a child of the devil that is a reprobate, that there is no hope for that person. That is what the, what the Bible refers to as a false prophet. But we have an example even with the Apostle Paul, right? He was Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. And he learned, the, now, we don't know, like, like he was learning and growing and, you know, and, and persecuting the church. So he was doing a lot ignorantly in what he was deceived by and thinking he was just following the truth. And it, it was a genuine, sincere, wrong belief. Thinking that, you know, he was just deceived. He, was, he, didn't, he didn't hear the gospel, reject it, and just decide, no, I'm still going to, you know, just preach out of the counsel of my own heart. He was deceived, but when he heard the truth, he received the gospel, he got saved. There are people out there like that. There are people that could come from false religions, you know, but I would say this, that that's probably an exception more than the rule, you know, when you, when you have people in these positions, because the position of a pastor will have a tendency to attract bad people. Just like any positions of power and authority, when you're given a position where there's a lot of trust, 
just inherently because you're going to a church, you're, you know, it, it should be expected. The people, you know, people in general are going to expect, hey, I should be able to feel safe in church. I want to come. I want to hear from the Bible. I want to do what's right. So I'm going to go to church. And who more can you trust than the pastor of a church? Right? I mean, if you're just thinking in general terms, hey, this should be a man of God. This should be someone that I could turn to and trust. And that trust is given oftentimes without even really getting to know somebody. Too many people will just walk in, you know, maybe they're going through a hard time in their life and they want to seek God. And who do they turn to? They turn into some church and, you know, they're trusting and are going to rely on the pastor to help them out. Because that trust exists, it's real. It's, it, it, it happens all the time. You have bad people with bad motives and bad intentions that are going to try to get into those positions because it's ripe for abuse. When you got people coming to you and just, just inherently trusting you, that is what wicked people want to have for their own gain, whatever it is that they're after, whether it be money, right? A lot of, a lot of preachers just love money. And they could figure, oh, I could say whatever I want and people will just look to me and already give me credibility and respect. And if I just preach whatever I want to preach, I could string these people along and get a lot of money out of them, make merchandise of people. The Bible warns about that. Other people have other intentions, other deviant, perverted lusts and desires that they want to fulfill. And when they gain people's trust and they need to file unstable souls, young people, whatever their wicked reprobate heart wants to do. But that's, you know, they, they come into a lot of these positions and then they just, and they don't care. They don't care. These people don't care about the word of God. They just have to use it in order to play the part. They have to put on the sheep coat, right? As a wolf to make themselves look like they're one of you. The false prophet is someone that is brought up over and over again throughout Scripture that we are being warned about because it is so serious and it is so deceptive and, it, and they can do so much damage. This is why we should not have inherent trust with any man. We trust in the Lord. We trust in God. We trust in God's Word absolutely without doubt but when it comes to a man you have to be guarded yes no matter who that man is you know whether it's me or anybody because the the wolf you know a good a good wolf they have a good sheep you know if they have a really good outfit on it's gonna be hard to tell it's gonna, you know eventually they get known eventually they get found out but you need to watch out just in general um it's a very serious thing. Now, the reason why I'm spending so much time even just kind of explaining all of that is because there is somebody that is exalted by the world that was a Baptist preacher. And from my understanding, it's someone that's exalted and lifted up in Georgia probably more than other places because he is from Georgia. And of course, I'm talking about the wicked Martin Luther King Jr., whose day is set aside tomorrow as a national holiday, which by the word holiday means holy day. It's a day set apart for an extremely wicked son of the devil. And his name is exalted and lifted up and is being taught. I mean, I remember from being taught in school. I was going to grammar school in the 80s and 90s. And, and from that point forward, I, I don't remember the exact date when, when you know, Congress, uh, this whoever, Congress or the president, whoever decided that there was going to be this national holiday and they're replacing George Washington's birthday with Martin Luther King. I think it was George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. There's like President's Day. It was George Washington. And then I remember there was like, you had George Washington's birthday, you had Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And then they made like President's Day. And then they just made Martin Luther King Jr. That's like they, they did all these moving around and that all happened while I was going to school I remember vaguely some of these different days but uh, I think it was during the Reagan administration so sometime in the in the 80s when when that happened 1982. 1982 thank you 
Do we have someone who knows the date? That's when that happened. So it's 1982. We're in 2019. You know, that's quite a while ago now. I mean, that's almost that's 35 years ago. I, you know, I'm, I'm not doing. I'm probably not doing the math right. 37 years ago. Long time. And people today, and in in schools and everywhere else, are just being taught. Wow, he was such a great man. He was such a civil rights leader, and all this stuff. And they're only going to tell you, wow, this guy was so great. We need to just make a holiday for this person because he was just someone that needs to be lifted up, someone that needs to be exalted. And that's all you hear about him. That's all I ever heard about him is only just, wow, this is just some great guy. He was a piece of trash. Now, if that offends you, you might have been brainwashed into thinking lies about him or just thinking that he was so good or you just haven't heard the full truth about him. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you ought to have zero respect for that person. I don't care what he's done in any civil rights issue at all because what he's done does not outweigh any of his wickedness. Being a Baptist minister, Baptist pastor, and, and the, the, the lies and the disgrace and the reprobate that he was, he was a, he was a wicked person. And we're going to get into some of that. But I started off with Jeremiah chapter 23 because we see here, you know, these prophets that have dreams. And of course, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. is known for his famous speech, you know, I have a dream. And there's nothing inherently wrong, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong in that very short you know, the speech that he made, or I have a dream, you know, in general, I'm not saying that that specific, ser you know, to call a sermon, speech, whatever you want to call it, was just inherently evil or bad, okay? There's nothing that, that I could think of that he said in that speech that was just like, oh man, this is just bad. But what he did, and this is just indicative of what he did, he preached just, just out of his heart, but he's, but he's speaking as a Baptist minister, and I'm, not, I'm also not saying that, that preachers can't get involved in politics or social issues. I'm not saying that at all. But this person had no respect for the Lord and abused the word of God. And we're going to get into what he believed and we're going to get into a few other things about that man and just uncover some of these truths about him just so you get the full picture and then you can decide for yourself whether what I'm saying is right or not. Because I, I'm making this statement. Martin Luther King Jr. was a wicked man and a false prophet and he's burning in hell right now. He was a disgrace and should not be some icon for civil rights. Not at all. He spake from his own heart. You would think that if someone was going to stand up for civil rights, as a preacher, as a man of God, a supposed man of God, you would think that they would be using Scripture, right? Exalting the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, hey, look, the Bible teaches that we're all of one blood. Because this is what the Bible teaches. This is what the, what, you know, the Bible is all about. That's what I'm saying. The, the cause itself of you know, trying to get, to get equal rights or equality for, for people of color, you know, that, there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, that in and of itself is, is great. I mean, yeah, we, we should all be looking at each other as, as people, not by the color of your skin or the race or anything like that. And as someone who's a Baptist minister, you should be getting up and saying, you know, as the Bible says in Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He didn't do that. He wasn't pointing to Jesus Christ. He wasn't pointing to the Lord and saying, hey, there's where the authority comes from. It comes from Scripture. It comes from the Bible. Or like it says in the Old Testament law, it says in Leviticus 19.33, and if a, sta a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. 
a stranger, a foreigner, someone different than you, someone from another country, another nation, someone that looks different from you. The Bible and the Old Testament law taught, hey, love them as yourself. There's one law that applies to everybody. There's no special cases for this race of people or this race of people. It's all the same. The law of the Lord is righteous and everybody's going to follow the same one. If someone comes to join themselves to be part of that nation, in this case it would be the nation of Israel, right? God's people. If you want to be among God's people, you're going to follow all the laws of the Lord just like anybody else would. And you're going to be treated just like anyone else would. And you ought to be loved just like anyone else would. Whether it's your physical brother or sister or someone who's become a brother or sister because they put their faith in the Lord. You love people equally. That's what, the, that's what the Bible says. That would be great if a Baptist preacher was the one saying, you know what, that would be someone you should exalt. That would be someone that you could be proud and that you can lift up and say, here's someone who's really working for equal rights or for civil rights. You know, that, that would be great. But that's not who this person was at all. Jeremiah 23, look down on verse number 25. The Bible says, I have heard what the prophet said that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. And that's all this man did was just preach his own heart, his own thoughts, his own opinions, just whatever. And a lot of those thoughts were extremely wicked. Now, I don't have like, all, the, 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 um, all the references for this. The guy, was, the guy believed in communism, first of all. The guy believed in, in, in just, he was like a Marxist. And that's why I, li I like how, how Pastor Anderson um, has, has renamed him. Instead of Martin Luther King, it's Marxist Lucifer King. And you know it's fitting in all aspects because he was a Marxist. He hung around. The people, his, his top advisors in his circle were literally like in the, in the Communist Party in the United States. And, and these were people who were closest to him. He had a known um, sodomite that was a communist that was, that was just in his inner circle. He wouldn't reject him. Like that was someone he was getting advice from. And, and, you know, the wicked, the wicked leaders surround themselves with wicked people. And, um, but I'm not even going to get into much about that because it's not, I'm not, this isn't about politics. This isn't about what you think is the, is the best form of government. The evils of communism, we could go into that on another day. Not, that doesn't have to be today. Um, but turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. And I just want to re reiterate this, too, because it says in the um, there are going to be people in this world, leaders, you know, that are that are mostly not saved and they stand for causes. They stand for, do, you know, whatever, any political cause. I don't have a problem with those people. There's nothing, you know, I'm not going to be preaching a sermon against every single person that has some, you know, some activist that has something going on. That that's. Neither here nor there. It's not a big deal. Uh, great. If people are, are working for a worthy cause, great. No problem with that at all. The problem that I have is with this man who's invoking the name of the Lord, a man that's supposed to be a Baptist pastor, and this man is what the Bible warns about in multiple places and defined as a false prophet or a wolf in sheep's clothing. And, that, and this is the big problem I have with him is that he was an ordained Baptist pastor. And you see the fruits of, of, of who he was. And it matches up perfectly with what the Bible is warning about a false, a false prophet, a false teacher. The Bible says there in Jeremiah 23, I know you're in 2 Peter chapter 2, but in, uh, in, second, in Jeremiah 23, 30, the Bible says, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. The Lord did not send Martin Luther King, Jr., to be his prophet. 
And we're going to get into what he actually believed. And we're going to, I have, I have words that he wrote down out of his heart and what he believes. And he completely rejects Christianity. Any form of orthodox Christianity in the sense of just what's accepted, even among about just about every single denomination of just basic facts of Christianity, of what you would say, if you believe this, you know, if you don't believe this, there's no way you could call yourself a Christian. It, the, the most basic fundamentals from the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, even to the resurrection. These are all critical things that you have to believe in order to call yourself a Christian, in order to even say that you're saved. You have to believe in these things. It's what the Bible teaches unequivocally. It's the most basic milk of the Scripture rejects all of it. But before we get into all of that, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 because I want to point out, we're going to read through some of the characteristics of a false prophet. And I'm going to read you some, some evidence that is come out again. Now, there is a lot of evidence against this man about what he did in his personal time and the adulteries and the sodomy and everything else that he did behind closed doors. There's plenty of that out there. I just brought a little bit this morning. I don't want to get too deep into this, but I've got a copy of, the, of an FBI report into him where they were investigating Martin Luther King Jr., because of his ties with communism and because they thought, you know, that he was involved in, in other things, they, they did an investigation on him. They bugged him. They tapped him. They even had video of, of you know, planted and, and places where he was. And they have evidence just beyond the shadow of a doubt of what he did in his personal life, let alone. I'm not, this goes into more of his contacts and everything with, with communists. But there's a section in this report, and you can see this after the service if you want. This has been hidden from the public for a long time, for a very long time. There's been portions that have been allowed where it's been redacted, but it wasn't until just recently when all the reports have just kind of been, and I don't even think all of them have been, have been made known yet because there's people that get mentioned that are still alive and they, you know, the government covers up for a lot of things and a lot of people and they don't want this to be found out until much later. And you say, oh, well, now we know the truth of it, but it doesn't matter because everyone who witnessed this stuff is dead. And there's no more you can do about it. And they just keep this stuff under lock and key. Um, that, again, that's another story. But I've got this, a copy of the facsimile of, of the FBI report of Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm just going to read this for you now, and then we'll read 2 Peter chapter 2, and just look at how it matches up perfectly. So there's a section here on King's personal conduct. This report says, with the funds that he had received from the Ford Foundation, King held the first of two workshops in Miami, Florida in February 1968 to train Negro ministers in urban leadership. So he's still, he's training ministers, right? This is, this is he's, he's operating as a, as a Baptist preacher, a pastor, training other men in ministry. So while he's doing this, it says, one Negro minister in attendance later expressed his disgust with the behind the scene drinking, fornication, and homosexuality that went on at the conference. So this guy's having a conference to train up ministers, and this one guy's just saying, I'm disgusted at what happened there behind the scenes. Like they have this party where people are just getting drunk, fornicating, and there's there's sodomy going on. I mean, just the lowest of the low. The, the, the most disgusting, reprobate things going on. It says several Negro and white prostitutes were brought in from the Miami area. And there was an all night event. And I'm not going to read everything here just because I don't want to even get too graphic. And it's not extremely graphic, but I just let's just say that there's an all night event going on with these prostitutes and some of the delegates in attendance. Uh, it says one room at a large table and it w which was filled with whiskey and a, vari a variety of sex acts deviating from the normal were observed. Just in public at this party, deviant events going on. This is, this is who Martin Luther King Jr. really was. This was his event. He was in these 
in these parties and participating in these events. It's not just that he was there in attendance. He was doing these things. He was witnessed as doing these things. Previous uh, sexual experiences here, it says, this activity is not new to King. So they're, 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 they're quoting basically what one person said that was going on at this one specific event. And then it goes on to, to report that this isn't new to King and his associates. This isn't something that, oh, it happened this one time and things got out of hand. This, is, uh, this was the norm for him. Because he was wicked, and this is just what he did. It says, as early as January 1964, King en engaged in another two-day drunken sex orgy in Washington, D.C. Many of those present engaged in, in sexual acts, natural as well as unnatural. And see, back at the time this report was written, they were using language that matches up pretty good with the scripture because it's, it was accurate. Yeah, it's unnatural acts. That's what sodomy is. That's what deviant and perversion do. It's not natural. It's not something that God intended for a man and a woman to do at all. It's just completely unnatural. And this is what they were into. And the false prophets so many times get into this sexual perversion. It says, uh, for the entertainment of onlookers. When, when one of the females shied away from engaging in an unnatural act, so someone that was there was just like, no, that's going too far. I don't want to do that. It says, King and other of the males present discussed how she was to be taught and initiated in this respect. So they're saying, no, we're, we're going we're gonna to make this happen to this person because they're predators, because that is how the sodomite, sodomite operates. Oh, you're not going to do this willingly? Well, we're going we're gonna to make this happen. We're going to get you into this anyways. That is how the sodomite operates. That is how the false prophet operates. They are wolves. That is the behavior of a wolf. There's no respect for people at all. Even people who might have gone so far into being involved in, in you know, bad, really wicked, bad behavior but are still not reprobated saying, well, I'm not going to do that. Like that's, that's, that's crossing a line. That's too far. And they're saying, no, we're going to make you cross that line. This is who Martin Luther King Jr. really was. This is what was in his heart. It says throughout the ensuing years and until this date, King has continued to carry on his sexual aberration secretly while holding himself out to public view as a moral leader of religious conviction. He is a hypocrite. He would say one thing to the public and do the exact opposite behind closed doors, do an exact thing that he was saying you shouldn't do. Um, and then this, I'm not going to get into all this. There's a whole section on him having mistresses. Um, just one quote from, from this. It says, as can be seen from above, it is a fact that King not only regularly indulges in adulterous acts, but enjoys the abnormal by engaging in group acts. And I'll just put it, leave it at that. It's disgusting. It's perverted. These are the facts about that man that people are going to be exalting tomorrow and saying, we're going we're gonna to cease from working to pay respect to this wicked, perverted, reprobate man. That's what he was involved in. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 12. Actually, let me get there real quick. I'll, start, I'll just read in verse number... beginning of the passage just to give you the context second Peter chapter 2 in verse number one about says but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 
Martin Luther King Jr., he brought upon himself swift destruction, by the way. He was assassinated. He was, mur he was killed. That's the judgment of God for his, for his wicked life that he, was, he was living, and, it didn't, and that was just the beginning of his judgment. It's going on to this day. Jump down there. I just wanted to read that, you know, verse, verse number one there of chapter two, just, just, it goes on to explain now all about these false prophets. Verse number 12 says, But these as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed. This is what God thinks of the false prophet. They're natural brute beasts. They're stupid animals that are made to be taken and destroyed. Not exalted and lifted up and given a day of honor. They're made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Riotous living, that's what this man was doing. He counted pleasure to just go and riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Again, evidenced with his life. He had multiple mistresses. He was, he was committing adultery on a regular basis and he was also involved in sodomite acts as well. Beguiling unstable souls in a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor, Bosor who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever." For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. He was a very good speaker. He was great at, at alluring to the lusts of the flesh and speaking these great swelling words of vanity. He had a lot of people following him. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Verse number 19. While they promised them liberty, isn't that what he was trying to do? Promise people liberty, freedom, right? They themselves are the servants of corruption. This was an extremely corrupt man. He was involved in all kinds of wickedness. He had ties to wicked people. What he was doing, and I don't think everything he was doing was just of his own accord. I think he was a puppet in many regards. He was a figurehead. He was someone who was propped up by other wicked people in conjunction with himself to be this figurehead and to be this leader who, when he was spiraling out of control, they finally just had to kill him off because he would have destroyed what was trying to be done by other wicked people behind the scenes. And they got to the point where they just couldn't contain it anymore. And it even got to the point to where there was a media blackout where you know, people are trying to expose what was going on, but the media didn't want to report on it, even though they had all the information, because they didn't want to hurt the cause. Instead of bringing stuff to light, which is what they're supposed to do, is what the media is supposed to do, and just say it is what it is. Nope. They wouldn't do that for him. But there, there comes a point where someone is just so wicked and bad that you, you're not going to be able to keep a lid on things for very long, and they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to do it with him, so... He was taken out. It says here in uh, verse number 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, I believe, and this is why I believe that most, most preachers that are, that are just preaching damnable heresies and things like that, I believe they are false prophets for the ma majority of them. 
Because if you're, if you're going to get into a position and you have to study the Bible, you have to know these things, I think in general you're going to know the way of righteousness. You're going to know at some point along the way, you know, what the Bible teaches. You're going to come across what's true and what's right and reject it. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but I would say the majority of the time when, when you have these people and these pastors that, are just, that they, they probably are false prophets. Because what happens is when you get confronted with the truth, with the way of righteousness, and you know it, and you understand it, and then you reject it, God rejects you. These things that we see in 2 Peter 2, you're going to see them in Jude. These describe the reverend Martin Luther King Jr., there's nothing reverend about his name. Now listen to his total rejection of the fundamental Christian truths in his own words. I have excerpts from his essays that were written by him himself. So this, this excerpt I'm going to read for you was written by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1949 and 1950. It spanned a little bit of time. These are excerpts from when he was in seminary. And this is his own, th I mean, these are like papers and things that he turned in. And this stuff is all readily available. You can fact check any of this that you want from like the King Foundation, like from his family, like all of his writings and stuff is all publicly available free of charge. They've made all these books and all his writings and speeches and all these other things. I found this stuff from, you know, basically out of his own mouth. I mean, it's from his own family's website in honor of him and giving all these writings. This is what he believed. And he had wicked instructors, by the way, too, because when he wrote these things, he was getting like A minus, B plus on these essays that he turned in of what he, I mean, it's, <laughs> this is why you shouldn't just automatically respect someone like, oh, you went to seminary? You know, people ask me, so your pastor, where did you go to school? Where do you, I, I definitely didn't go to this wicked place where, where Martin Luther King Jr. went to. I have no respect to anyone that went to that school and stuck with it. <laughs> you didn't turn and run the other way after being involved in the first class that, that talked about these things. But, but listen to this. I'll just read this for you. He says, The orthodox attempt to explain the divinity of Jesus in terms of an inherent metaphysical substance within him seems to me quite inadequate. To say that the Christ, whose example of living we are bid to follow, is divine in an ontological sense is actually harmful and detrimental. What is he saying there? He's saying that to try to explain the divinity of Christ, that he was literally like the son of God in the flesh, that he was, yes, man, because he was born of Mary, but then, yes, God, because he was born of the Holy Ghost with God the Father as his father, right? As, as, a, as a physical being, you know, like that, that's literally... His, his makeup as a man, he's saying that that's inadequate, that we shouldn't understand him that way because we were taught to follow his example. And, that, and basically what he's saying, and I'll read his own words, but basically what he's saying is that, you know, well, how could we possibly follow him if he's this God-man, right? So it's inadequate to the, you know, he was teaching everyone to follow him, so... We, it's too easy for the person to just say, well, that's because that was Jesus, and of course I can't do that. So, so because he didn't like that, he just didn't believe that then. He's like, well, that couldn't be the case. And, and I'll read to you more, but I mean, he just, he rejects the whole Bible. He rejects all of it. To invest this Christ with such supernatural qualities makes the rejoinder, oh, well, he had a better chance for that kind of life than we can possibly have. And I'm going to read this the way it ought to be. There are so many grammatical mistakes and misspellings. <laughs> and I think they put that in there. I mean, it was verbatim. It's word for word what he, what he wrote. Okay. And I'm going to try to, to do my best. To, and so it may not be verbatim. It's because I'm going to try to make it the way that, that he intended it to be with the words that make sense. Because he says... Uh, for, for that kind of life than we can possible have. He meant possibly, right? 
Um, in any case, I'm going to keep reading. In other words, one could easily use this as a means to hide behind his failures. So that the orthodox view of the divinity of Christ is, in my mind, quite readily denied. The true significance of the divinity of Christ lies in the fact that his achievement is prophetic and promissory for every other true son of man who is willing to submit his will to the will and spirit of God. Christ was to be only the prototype of one among many brothers. Basically, that Jesus Christ is just supposed to be like an example of any other man that can do the exact same thing as Jesus Christ. That, yeah, he was a very exceptional person or a man, but... That's what everyone should do and that we can do and just be just like Christ said that because he wasn't God in the flesh. And people, basically what he's believing is that people just ascribe deity to him because he was so great. Because he stood up above the rest, because he was just such a, a good person. But basically we all have that same potential to just be exactly like Jesus Christ, but he just happened to be really good. So people just said, well, he must be God then. That's, that's wicked. Is that, that's the only reason? In another essay written in 1949, he writes this, In this paper we shall discuss the experiences of early Christians which lead to three rather orthodox doctrines. The divine sonship of Jesus, the virgin birth, and the bodily resurrection. Yeah, I would say those are rather orthodox doctrines. The, son, the divine sonship of Jesus, the virgin birth, and the bodily resurrection. <coughs> he continues, Each of these doctrines is enshrined in what is known as the Apostles' Creed. It is this creed that has stood as a symbol of faith for many Christians over the years. Even to this day, it is recited in many churches. But in the minds of many... Now, does it, do people here know what the Apostles' Creed is? In general, I mean, you've heard it before. I would have to, to look at it again. I, this is something I had memorized in the Presbyterian Church, you know, the Reformed Catholic Church. This is something that you just kind of have to memorize all this stuff. But thinking back on it, I, don't, I can't think of anything that was really wrong about the, other than the fact that they say we believe, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. That was part of the, the Apostles' Creed. I don't believe that. But basically it says, you know, talk about Jesus, he descended into hell, through, you know, uh, he rose again from the dead. He, you know, it just gives like this real basic summary of, of Christianity. Real basic fundamentals. And he's saying, you know, this is enshrined and this is what people are up to. And he says, it's even recited in many churches. Then he goes, continues, he says, but in the minds of many sincere Christians... Basically just claiming that anyone who believes this stuff isn't sincere. But in the minds of many sincere Christians, this creed has planted a seed of confusion which has grown to an oak of doubt. He's saying these basic beliefs is causing confusion to where people are now just doubting Christianity. because He's bringing that back to these beliefs. They see this creed as incompatible with all scientific knowledge. And so they have proceeded to reject its content. So he's saying they're sincere Christians that are holding to science falsely so-called, and that's making them doubt that any of these things are even real. You'll notice if you read his stuff, he has a very, very strong um, attachment to scientific knowledge, the science of the day, because he's just like any atheistic unbeliever he believes in science that's falsely so called and thinks that that refutes god's word in 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 every capacity he says basically he doesn't believe in miracles he doesn't believe in that a virgin can can conceive and and give birth under the power of god right like obviously yeah physically that can't happen that's why it's a miracle he doesn't believe in that he doesn't believe in anything that's supernatural or miraculous at all because his faith is in science, in what you can see or touch or whatever. Not, he has no faith. No faith in the unseen. He says, but if we delve into the deeper meaning of these doctrines and somehow strip them of their literal interpretation, we will find that they are based on a profound foundation. So, 
he doesn't believe the Bible literally. And he just said that. How then did this doctrine of divine sonship come into being? So how did this even happen? Why, why are there so many people who even believe this? How did that happen? We may find a partial clue to the actual rise of this doctrine in the spreading of Christianity into the Greco-Roman world. I need not elaborate on the fact that the Greeks were very philosophical-minded people. Through philosophical thinking, the Greeks came to the point of subordinating, distrusting, and even minimizing anything physical. Anything that possessed flesh was always undermined in Greek thought. And so, in order to receive inspiration from Jesus, the Greeks had to apotheosize him. We must remember that the Logos concept had its origin in Greek thought. It was only natural that the early Christians, after coming in contact with the Greeks, would be influenced by their thought. So he's saying, oh, the reason why he was viewed as divinity, it's because of the Greeks. It's because of the Romans. It's not because of the, you know, Jesus Christ saying he was the son of God. It's not because of any of those. It's not because of all the miracles that were performed. It's not because he did things that no man have ever done. It's not because he raised the dead. It's not because of any of those. It's just because, well, the Greeks, are, they're really philosophical minded. And in order for them to even make any sense of Jesus, they have to separate him from the flesh and just say, oh, yeah, he must be some god. Right? Because that's how they viewed their pagan gods. So they're saying they just basically made Jesus into this pagan god, and, and that's now why all Christians believe that he's deity. It's because of these Romans. This is what Martin Luther King Jr. believes. He is a wicked, reprobate, false prophet. Continuing on, the church called Jesus divine because they had found God in him. They could only identify him with the highest and best in the universe. It was this great experience with the historical Jesus that led the early Christians to see him as the divine son of God. It's just because they found God in him is what he says. Basically, they were able to come to God through Jesus, so they're just saying, well, that's, he must be God. Which is totally misrepresenting what Christianity believes. And... <laughs> it's, just, it's just a lie. It's a lie out of hell. The second doctrine in our discussion posts, posits the virgin birth. This doctrine gives the modern scientific mind much more trouble than the first. Again, you notice the scientific mind? Well, this gives the scientific mind much more trouble. The virgin birth. For it seems downright improbable and even impossible for anyone to be born without a human father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's why it's called a miracle. First, we must admit that the evidence for the ten tenability of this doctrine is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. He's basically saying there's no evidence for this at all. Any objective thinker, there's just not enough evidence to even say that this is real or true. To begin with, the earliest written documents in the New Testament make no mention of the virgin birth. Moreover, the Gospel of Mark the most primitive and authentic of the four. So he's just coming up with this, just saying, well, the Gospel of Mark is just the most authentic. That is the most true. Already saying that you, can't, you just can't believe what they say. And if you're going to believe any of them, I mean, the Gospel of Mark is the most true. And when it's convenient and it fits what he wants to believe, out of his own wicked heart that Jesus Christ was not God in the flesh, that Jesus Christ was not born of a virgin, then he just turns to it and says, because, you know, the book of Mark, it doesn't go through the birth story like Matthew and Luke do, right? So he's going to say, oh, well, Mark, Mark's the one that we can trust and it doesn't say that, so therefore it must not have happened. Even though you've got two other witnesses in the New Testament totally outlining the virgin birth. He just says, well, you know, Mark is the, the most authentic of the four. It gives not the slightest suggestion of the virgin birth. The effort to justify this doctrine on the grounds that it was pr predicted by the prophet Isaiah is immediately eliminated. And he's saying, you can't just trust that just because Isaiah said, you know, a virgin shall conceive and give birth. He said, just because the Bible says that, he says that, that is not evidence at all. We could just eliminate that. Why? It says, for all, all New Testament scholars agree 
that the word virgin is not found in the Hebrew original, but only in the Greek text, which is a mistranslation of the Hebrew word for young woman. All, new t all scholars agree. They all agree. That's why we have in almost all Bibles, Isaiah 9, or Isaiah 7, 14 says, a virgin. But all the scholars agree. If they all agree, then why do almost all of the version? I mean, I don't care which version you choose. Almost all of them are going to say virgin. Not just the King James. I mean, you just go and look them up. But, but they all agree. You liar. You stinking hypocrite. You devil. Martin Luther King Jr. Denying the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14 says this. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. If Isaiah 7, 14 was simply mistranslated in English, then why would there be so much more detail about Mary being a virgin from two other witnesses, Matthew and Luke, in so much corroborating detail? See, he's just saying, oh, it's just this mistranslation of that one verse. If it literally was a mistranslation, wouldn't the people in the, you know, Matthew and Luke, wouldn't they know Hebrew? Wouldn't they know what that verse was saying? So in their writings, it's not just then a mistranslation in the Greek also. It's not just the fault or the cause of someone doing a translation from one language to another. Because if, that were the, if it was just some mistranslation of one word, you wouldn't have like what Matthew 1 from verse 22 to 25 all is talking about or being a virgin. And you also wouldn't have from Luke 1.26 to Luke 1.35 in all of that context, all referring to a virgin giving birth. My, Matthew 1.22 says, Now this, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So it quotes the Old Testament right there, but then it continues on, verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. All of verse 25 is saying that she was a virgin. So it's not just one word that's twisted. It's saying that, no, she, he actually did not know her. She remained a virgin for that entire time. That's not one mistranslation of a word. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what this witness is claiming Matthew. Luke 1.26 is even more detailed. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin. This isn't quoting Isaiah. This is, a, this is an angel that went to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And again, he uses that word virgin. She's a virgin. Mary's a virgin. Are we getting a clear picture here? Verse 28, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? How am I going to have a child, seeing I'm a virgin? I haven't been with a man. How can this even happen? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It is explained in detail what's going to happen. This is not a mistranslation. This is intentional rejection of what the Bible says. From someone who's supposed to be studying and learning the Bible, studying the scripture, and someone who's going to be a teacher of God's word, 
saying, nope, just with one broad brush, nope, mistranslation, dishonest, even just with, with the handling of the scripture, and total, utter rejection of the basic truths of what the Bible teaches. Continuing on with what he wrote, a clue to this inquiry may be found in a sentence from St. Justin's first apology. Here Justin states that the birth of Jesus is quite similar to the birth of the sons of Zeus. So again, he's going back to this Greek and, and Roman mythology and just saying that it's, well, it's all just a result of, of this mythology, that it's in the Bible. It was believed in Greek thought that an extraordinary person could only be explained by saying that he had a father who was more than human. It is probable that this Greek idea influenced Christian thought. Influenced Christian thought when Matthew's writing the gospel of Jesus Christ, when Luke, the beloved physician, was writing under Theophilus. These people who spent their time with Jesus Christ and were first-hand witnesses. But yeah, they, they were just totally given over to, to Greek mysticism. They only knew that they had been with the Jesus of history and that his spiritual life was so far beyond theirs that to explain his biological origin as identical with theirs was quite inadequate. We of this scientific age, again, there's a reference to science, science, right? Where, who is his God? Science. We of this scientific age will not explain the birth of Jesus in such unscientific terms, but we will have to admit with the early Christians that the spiritual uniqueness of Jesus stands as a mystery to man. You're saying, well, we don't know exactly what it is, but we know that he wasn't God. We know that it wasn't a virgin birth. That's what he's saying. He's saying, well, he's a really great person. Yeah, he was very unique. The last doctrine in our discussion deals with the resurrection story. This doctrine upon which the Easter faith rests symbolizes the ultimate Christian conviction that Christ conquered death. From a literary, historical, and philosophical point of view, this doctrine raises many questions. In fact, the external evidence for the authenticity of this doctrine is found wanting. Again, he's saying there's no evidence to believe this. No reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's lacking. There's no proof. This didn't happen. But here again, the external evidence is not the most important thing, for it in itself fails to tell us precisely the thing we most want to know. What experiences of early Christians lead to the formation of the doctrine? He's saying what we really want to know is just how did this doctrine even come about? No. That's not what we all most want to know. It came about because it actually happened. It's as simple as that. There's no other ulterior explanation or motive behind a doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ other than it is what God has already prophesied. It is what actually happened. It is what witnesses recorded, wrote down, and God preserved for us today. It's a very simple explanation. It doesn't go any deeper than that. But, but for Martin Luther King, who has rejected God's word, who has rejected the truth, he needs to come up with some other explanation. Just like people who reject Genesis want to say, well, there's this big bang and everything just came from nothing. And at some point, nothing exploded. And here we are and everything's here and it all evolved. The most stupid, asinine explanation ever given, we just came from nothing. Fools believe in that because they don't want to just accept the truth. Well, this fool doesn't believe in the virgin birth, doesn't believe in the deity of Christ, and doesn't even believe in the resurrection. So he has to come up with any type of explanation he can to justify this. And this is, this is someone who's a Baptist pastor. A Baptist. Doesn't sound like a Baptist to me. Sounds like a devil to me. I'll finish reading what he has here. The root of our inquiry is found in the fact that, these, that the early Christians had lived with Jesus. They had been captivated by the magnetic power of his personality. This basic experience led to the faith that he could never die. So basically he's just saying, well, he just had this really charismatic personality. He was just magnetic. He was just someone that people were drawn to. 
and he was just so just overwhelming in his character that people just thought, wow, this guy can never die. And so in the pre-scientific thought pattern of the first century, this inner faith took outward form. But it must be remembered that before the doctrine is formulated or the event recorded, the early Christians had had a lasting experience with the Christ. They had come to see that the essential note in the fourth gospel is the ultimate force in Christianity, the living, deathless person of Christ. They expressed this in terms of the outward, but it was an inner experience that led to its expression. He's saying the story was fictitious and created that Jesus Christ rose from the dead based on their inner experience with him and just their thought, wow, this guy can never die. We don't want this guy to ever die. And basically, in, in a roundabout way, that's what he's saying is that this is just their outward expression of saying he rose again from the dead to make him live on forever. But he rejects that it ever happened. This man was an ordained Baptist pastor that denies the deity of Christ, denies the virgin birth, denies the resurrection, uh, and among a host of, I mean, you know, I'm, there's no point in getting in anything else because how can you even call yourself a Christian when you deny all these things? Even the cults believe some of these things. I mean, a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness is going to believe some of these things. They're closer to Christianity than Martin Luther King Jr. was. He was an adulterer, a drunkard, and a sodomite. Tell me again why we should exalt such a man as this? In his speech, I have a dream, he said he dreams of a day where you know, men could be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's why everything that I said about Martin Luther King Jr., this is the content of his character. And you know what? By his own words, he's going to be condemned. Every idle word that man shall speak. He, he condemned himself. The content of his character, that's how he ought to be judged. But what happens today? What is he being judged on? He's being judged on the color of his skin. Because people want to exalt him. Because he stood for civil rights and he's a black man that stood up against authority or whatever, whatever you want to say. They have more respect for that than actually the content of his character. Because his character speaks volumes. And it is not someone who ought to be lifted up and exalted. Not in any way, shape, or form. And no Christian should ever say, oh, I, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was a great man. He was a great son of Belial is what he was. He was a great child of the devil. You want to promote the truth about what the Bible teaches about, about racial equality? Amen and amen. Why don't we lift up Jesus Christ as that example of the person who came and died for all nations, that all nations of the earth might be blessed? That is the real hero. That should be the person we exalt more than any man. The man Jesus Christ has said and done more for the cause of every person under the sun. Let's lift him up and let's, and let's use God's word to promote the truth and not reference some adulterous, sodomite, wicked pervert. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for loving us and for, for the great truths that you've preserved for us today. God, I pray that you please help us not to be caught up in emotionalism or be, uh, be swayed through propaganda in, in what the, the world wants to teach us as, as who we ought to look up to, but that we would judge men by the content of their character and how it stands up against your words, dear Lord. I, I thank you for giving us all the warnings about the false prophets and these deceivers that are out there because um, it, it really helps us to have a good insight on, 
on what is going on with these people behind the scenes. And it should have been enough of a warning just hearing what this man taught and, and believed just from, from a scriptural standpoint with himself standing up, professing to be a man of God. It should have been no surprise that all of the other um, characteristics and, and things that he had done behind closed doors, none of that should even be shocking based on what he taught and what he believed and his total utter rejection of you, of Jesus Christ, of, of all, all of the Bible, dear Lord, and um, help us to be wise in our understanding and help us to, um, to push for, for what's right and what's truthful, but not to use wicked men to do so. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.